rather not think about the mansions of Kashi. I like to think about the one who made them. Forest was already made. Who was probably already made them for us, man? Be like going to the Smithsonian, knowing all that nice artwork is there, and there's no light switch to turn on so you can look at it. That's what heaven would be like without Jesus Christ. I mean, street of gold and all the gems and all that stuff. And okay, some loved ones up there. That'll be cool. But I want to go see Him. I want to go see Jesus Christ. That's who I want to see. So, all right. On that cheery note, let's, let's have some questions tonight. Would you like that? <laughs> That's it, man. I mean, honestly, if you were in the nursery, you'd know these questions. The nur- the nur- and that's it. The nursery I'm teaching. <laughs> All right, this is easy. Come on, man. Just somebody please tell me what Balaam's doctrine was, his doctrine. What did he teach? Because that's what doctrine in its essence is. Give it a shot, Brother Bert. There's, a, there's actually two things in particular that are mentioned in, in Revelation about this. Go ahead. Hopefully I'm not mixing them up. Uh, thumb, fornication. Yep. Slide, slide. That's, yep. Go over to Revelation 2, please. Revelation 2. Balaam turns out to be a pretty wicked guy, man. <laughs> but he doesn't actually doesn't start out that way. It's, you know, it, 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 he's, a, he's a very interesting character. Uh, Brother Bert, can you get chapter 2, 12 down through 14 for now, please? And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Amen. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, and even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days, wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelt. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. So here it is. To eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. There you go. Bad news, man. Now you have the doctrine of Balaam, but what do you have over... What else does he also have? He has the way of Balaam. He's a bad dude, man. He's, he, he's, he's a real bad dude. While you're right here, Brother Burke, because you did such a, a good job, and, and I'm proud of you, could you, uh, could, could you uh, read 18, please, through 20 of, this, of the same chapter, Revelation 2, 18. Now look at Thyatira. These things said the Son of God, who had his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last mm-hmm. more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever noticed that before? Jezebel and Jezebel and Balaam have the same doctrine. One's just a female version. Pretty wild, huh? Jezebel gets her name from now. Who, do you know who? Does anybody know who Jezebel's daddy was? Ethabel. Who do you think that family worships? And, well, Balaam's name has got Baal right in it, man. So what do they like to do? Eat things sacrificed under idols, commit fornication. It's pretty wild stuff, huh? Pretty, anybody know what Thyatira means? You have a city like that in Acts 16. In fact, Lydia, the seller of purple, gets saved in the city of Thyatira that she dwells in. Pretty neat, man. And she's a female. And you've got a, a horrible female right here working in the... Same region. What is Kenny? You know Thyatira. He's adjusting the camera, so this gets on camera. Go ahead, nice and loud, nice and loud, Kenny. An otter. No, it's not an otter, man. He didn't. He ain't on his back breaking oysters. <laughs> Go. Go ahead. Order, order of attraction. Oh man, <laughs> Kenny, we will. 
Kenny, we went over this a thousand times on Tuesday night. Let, okay, in English, odor of affliction. <laughs> Between Thessie, Thessie, Timmy, Timmy, you just cri you crippled Bert out, man. He's done. Okay, what is per does anybody know what Pergamos means or Pergamos if you pronounce that? Can you read that one? Much marriage. Much marriage. Church begins married. getting married to the world. That's correct. There you go. <laughs> Kenny, you are honestly say amen right there. Anyway, all right. I need to know, and I, this is a repeat from uh, like last year because I went through my questions, but um, I need the first and five major sacrifices in the book of Leviticus. Just somebody give me one of the five, and we'll go see how many we can get. Is that an itch, or is that a, I have one? Are you yeah. contemplating? Just give me one. That's what they produce, but don't, there's no... It's not like you're having a migraine or something. No, but what's the name of one of them? There are sweet-smelling and non-sweet-smelling, but there's three that are sweet and two that are not. Taylor, give me one. Peace offering? Peace offering is one, right? Jonathan? No, that's in Hebrews 13. Peace offering is one of them. That's a sweet smelling savor. Go ahead, Justin, give me one. Sin offering? Yep. Uh, I got Polly over here. Polly? Meat offering? Meat offering, a bloodless one. F is domin, Philistines, without shedding of blood. That's like the corn of wheat from John 12. Jesus Christ, that perfect sinless life like flower. So we have peace, we have sin, we have meat. <laughs> Wave offering. No. It is. It's not one of the main first five ones? No, man. Mo, you're going to give it a shot, and then we're going to go over to Genius. Burn offering or that uh, Yeah, burn offering is the, that's the first one. We'll go to Mrs. Genius. Go ahead. Deb, we have four of them. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say burnt offering. Well, so, I was, um, I was looking for another one here. So you have burnt meat and peace. Those are sweet savor. Smelling because you know why? They're offered just their, their free will. But then you have the sin offering, because sin needs to be dealt with. That doesn't smell good to God. But there's something within the sin offering that's right before it that's similar to sin, but it's different. Begins with Go ahead, Haley. Uh, Haley? Right, there you go. That's the first five major ones of living. So trespass and sin. What's that? When you're at a baseball game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the wave offering. That must have been crazy actually seeing the wave offering, man. But don't you lift up holy hands, and then when you really look at what that thing has to involve in all that, there's nothing in my hands, Lord, but whatever I, I if I do have it, it's yours. And there's, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot to that, man. It's not lifting up holy hands during the song service and all kinds of crazy stuff like that, man, or laying hands on people like they do in a lot of the Pentecostal churches. There's actually some meaning to it back in the book of Leviticus and all that, laying your hands on stuff. So pretty, pretty cool. All right, last question, and we'll get into it for the evening. I need some verses on body parts. I don't care if it's a hand, a finger, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, fingers, toes, legs, you, whatever, whatever you have for verse, Brother Justin, start it off. Give me a reference too, buddy, when you turn. Proverbs 521, for the eyes of the Lord are both for the <laughs> For the ways of a man are before the, the eyes uh, of the Lord. Okay. The no, there you go. That's 521. For the ways, of a, of the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Now, you don't have to, if he, if he takes the eyes, you don't have, I mean, if you have one on the eyes, go ahead and take it. But let's see how many body parts we can get. Brother Jonathan, then we'll go, and I'll go over that way. Genesis 2.21. <laughs> go ahead. And the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall on Adam, upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up his flesh. That's a, that's a great one right there, man. You, did you get saved? It's just big, Mrs. A haircut and a, and a verse. You're a, you're a Baptist man. You're an independent. <laughs> that's all. Aw that's awesome. Hold on just for a second. I'm gonna Jennifer, then Mo, then we'll come right back over there. Oh, really? Go ahead.
Pretty cool. See, you got to, you got to. That's that's pretty good stuff, man. You do know that God has body parts, right? Yeah. Mo, then we'll go to James. Go ahead, Mo. Wow. This is big. I mean, honestly, this is this is a big this is big, man. James, go ahead, fire away if you have a verse for me. Go ahead. Yeah, Matthew eighteen nine, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into, into life life. With one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into cast hellfire. So don't tell me that uh, that hell's the grave. Yeah. When he told you to mutilate, mutilate yourself, easy for me to say, mutilate yourself. I sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger for a minute. Mutilate. <laughs> and so, uh, when he told you to mutilate yourself, it would be better for you to do that than to go to this place called help. Oh, but it's still the same. Don't worry about it. Cut your hand off or your foot or any of that stuff? Come on, man. All right, did I have, let's go right, we're going to go, and then we'll go over to, we'll go over to Polly. Speaking of Arnold, we'll go over there, man. Let's go, let's go uh, Haley, Haley, Taylor, and then we'll go down to Burt, and we'll work our way over. Matthew 22, 13. Then said the king to his servants, find him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow, we got teeth? We got hand. Man, that's pretty good, man. It's pretty cool. Must be a lot of medical professionals in our, <laughs> in our audience. Taylor, go ahead. James 3, 6. The tongue. And that's the preacher in the family right there. That's why you got to go. Why do you got to go there? That's written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Doesn't apply to me. I wish to God it didn't, man. We'll just go to the several hundred verses in Proverbs that do, or other places. So, Brother Bert, and we'll. Well, I have the same number, but it's Luke sixteen twenty four. Mm hmm. Said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may. Father, well, that's actually two. Give yeah. <laughs> Yeah, finger and tongue. It's pretty wild. Deborah. Um, Proverbs twenty-five seventeen. Oh man, that's my neighborhood. Go ahead. Withdraw that foot from the neighborhood house. house. <laughs> <You'd> be... <laughs> yeah, you guys ain't ever coming over again. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a good one, man. Withdraw that foot from the neighbor's house. Let's see. Yeah, we're. I'm tired of you coming over. Get out of here, man. You spent five minutes here. Ate my food. Now get out. <laughs> Pauly, go ahead. Isaiah 41, verse 13. Oh, he's just showing off now. I know. Go ahead, bro. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand. Sing unto thee. Fear not. I will help thee. So specifically, right hand. Yeah. You want some kudos for that one, don't you? <laughs> it's pretty good, man. Kenneth? <laughs> oh, wow. This is the suck-up section over here. 2619, covenant, and an unfaithful man in the time of trouble was like a broken tooth. And a foot out of the... 2519. Yeah. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble. It's like a broken tooth and foot out of the joint. You can't get a better picture than that man, if you've ever twisted your ankle and smashed your teeth in, man. What a crazy thing. Give me a... Uh, I saw some stuff going on here between Jennifer and her mom, <laughs> passing notes in class. Go ahead. Did, she, did your daughter give this to you? No. Good. Amen. <laughs> Leviticus 7, three. <laughs> and he shall offer of it all the fat thereof. <laughs> and the fat I love rump. <laughs> rump and fat, you can't beat that with a stick. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want somebody to quote, and he looked in the liver. Somebody's got you, you, you know, look in the liver, you know? It's got the inner, it's not the inner. It, it, whatever. <laughs> I, it, it, that don't matter. Whatever, what, yeah, whatever. You know, it's, it, it's, it's whatever Baptist church, man. We, no, no, it's, it's, I, there's nothing like a rump, man. How about kidneys, man? Kidneys are in there. Yeah. The call. Yep. There's all kinds of stuff, man. Yeah. Go ahead, Brother Burton, and then we'll, we'll get a roll in here. Genesis 32, 32. <laughs> yeah. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew 
Yep. I'm telling you, that's what's happening in my right thigh right now, man. My right hip. <laughs> Wrestling with the angel of the Lord all night. Now, you know that wasn't much of a match, even though it seems like, oh, well, he's really winning. Yeah. He's holding him off like your big brother with his little kid brother like this. And he's just swinging like this, man. <laughs> okay, we've had enough. Touch your hip. <laughs> he can touch your hip and rip your biggest muscle in your body <laughs> like you're going to win. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's funny stuff, man. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we looked last week at how the God shifted his particular... Go, go to Matthew 10 while I'm, while I'm blurbulating here. We saw how uh, the Lord shifted his focus from Israel as we're looking at this mystery. The, the blindness in part has happened to Israel. They are still God's people physically. They need to be saved by and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, you will not make it claiming to be a physical Jew into God's glory. You have to have the new birth. You need to be regenerated. You need to be washed in the blood and have your sins forgiven. Uh, if you think you're a Jew, I mean, I know there's people on the street, if, if and when you come out with us and you've been out with us before, you always get somebody who's a smart guy or a smart girl that goes by and says, I'm a Jew. Yeah. Number one, if you were... What does that matter? Number two, you're probably just doing it to be a, a jerk. You know, uh, but the reality is this is that physically, Jew or Gentile, without Christ, you're lost. You're without Christ having no hope without God in the world. You're dead in trespasses and sins. You need to have the, the, that sin issue taken care of by the blood sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't care what your denomination is or what your skin color is. You're either washed in the blood, saved by grace through faith, or you're not. That's it. End of story. Don't care what church you attend. I don't care how many good works you have. I don't care how intellectual you are. I don't care what degree you have or the letters past your name. If you're not saved the Bible way by the grace of God through that shed blood, you are not saved. So you can say you're a Jew all the way, all the way till you die. And God's going to say, go take your place with another Jew that's down there. In fact, he's been down there since Luke 16. You say, how do I know that? Father Abraham. Father Abraham. Why would you call him Father Abraham if you're not, you, you're not part of that, that whole genealogy? So you'll go to hell as a lost Jew, and you'll go to hell as a lost Gentile. You need the blood of Jesus Christ. You need his righteousness for your unrighteousness, his clean robe for your filthy rags. And God will put you in the family of God. And that, that, that's how God does it. But that doesn't mean that God is done with Israel. It just means he has shifted the program from them as being the head. Now they're at the tail. And we saw that last week with Stephen. Does anybody remember what the significant thing regarding Stephen and his death? And we kind of spent a few minutes on it last week. When Stephen preaches basically the whole book, the whole Old Testament, gives him an Old Testament survey in about 40 verses, they pick up rocks because it was such a great message, and they, they, they stone him. And what does Stephen see? Go ahead. You no. Jennifer raised her mitt. <laughs> what is his title? You're right. He, Jesus is. What, what is his title? He's the son of what? When he stands in that passage, son of man. That is a correlation to the second coming, the millennial reign. I don't have it all figured out, but I know that if things fall into place the way they fall into place, that very well could have been God saying. Let's go. What do you have basically after Acts 7? If you were to take out from Acts 7, and I understand there's a lot in the book of Acts, and we looked at a bunch of verses where God turns the page from the, from the Jew to the Gentile, but if you went from Acts to Hebrews, what would you really miss? You'd miss the, you'd miss the Pauline epistles, but who's Paul the apostle to? Because now they're getting... Graft in, now they have the opportunity to hear the gospel of the grace of God. It, it, it's amazing how that God has put this book together, and nothing man does will ever sway God's plan. I, I don't, this is not my father's world. The God of this world is running this show. His name is Satan underneath the auspices and power of God right now. This is not my father's world. When he comes back, his son sets foot, there'll be the world to come and all that stuff. But the reality is now it's under the charge of a clown, the would-be king. 
So, I mean, I, I mean not, not even that upsets God's plan. Satan being in charge. Men turning perverse. Women turning perverse. None of that upsets God's plan. In fact, it's right in line with it. Go to Matthew 10. I know this is a familiar spot, but I want to give you just a little bit of background where we were. Uh, Brother Justin, can you get one... Man. Man. Can you just do one through eight for now, please? Uh, Matthew 10. One through eight, please. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and mm-hmm. all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose name, surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed mm-hmm. him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There you go. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. That commission given to those original 12, he tells them to not go to two specific groups of people. Who were they? Samaritans and who? Well, I thought he came to save the whole world. Well, you can look at it now that way. And yes, the sin payment was made, and I understand that, but you've got to understand God's plan in this whole thing. Uh, I am, for, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For as the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the... And it was necessary, we read last week, that the word of God be first given to you. Because the promises were given to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the, and the 12 sons of Jacob, and all that way through. And that physical kingdom, but also the redemption and atonement for their sins, after all those uh, pigeons and turtle doves and bulls and goats and all that, you need to have the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, a Judaic Messiah who could come and pay for the sins of that whole nation and wash them away. We get in on that now. But that's not a Gentile book, man. That's a Jewish book with Jewish authors and Jewish apostles and the whole nine. We get in on it because of what we saw last week. But God is not done with them. They're just enjoying God's judgment right now called blindness in part is happening to them. Okay? And we saw the shift in the book of Acts last week. So let, let's take a look at this. In, uh, go to Acts chapter number 9. Let's do some stuff in the book of Acts and then we'll move on down the road. Acts chapter number 9. Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 9. I need uh, Kenny, you here? here. All right, F- chapter 9, 15 to 25. I want to make a point tonight in a few minutes we have that, okay, so God made the promise to the nation of Israel. We saw that in the first couple weeks. And then we saw how that God, after in particular with Stephen, sees the Lord stand up, but then he sits back down. We see the, the, the whole thing shift in the book of Acts. You now start having Samaritans getting the gospel preached to them in chapter 8. You see the apostles of the Gentiles get called out in 9. You see uh, Cornelius and the door of faith open to the Gentiles in Acts 10 and 11, the first call Christians at Antioch. And then it just goes on down the road from there where God is changing the game plan. And none of it breaks his promises. But now I want to show you that the blindness in part tonight, and where, where where we're going tonight, is that they are not just blind in part. That's true. They're actually enemies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The same people that God sent His Son to pay their sins for. The same people that God sent His Son to redeem them from, redeem them from the hands of their enemies. He's not going to sit on the throne of the White House. He's going to sit on the throne of David because of the promise God made with the Davidic covenant back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He's going to sit on a Judaic throne ruling from Jerusalem. But yet, they despised him and hated him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Uh, we have no king but Caesar. Uh, his blood be on us and on our children. 
So though they are the, the children of God and the people of God and the nation of God and all the promises and the fathers and the covenants and circumcision and all that stuff, they turn through the book of Acts in particular. And I, I know it started in, in sections before that, but you really see it in the book of Acts. But now they're not just that blindness in part, but now they're actually going to be directly opposed to the preaching of the very God that came to save them. It's all part of that blindness. I may, if, I've never been blind, and honestly, thank God for it, I wouldn't want to be blind. I really wouldn't. It might be easier now, or I mean, it might have been easier if I was blind from birth, but now that you've seen everything, and then, <laughs> then mom rearranges the furniture so I smash my face against stuff, you know? Uh, but being, and, and being blind, it, it, it would be horrible. I don't know how that guy that does it, uh, Brother uh, Eric DeClerc, big old tall uh, South African guy, he's, out, he's a pastor out in Idaho, the guy that got his, uh, his degree from TBDI, and he's, he's completely blind, and he gets up there uh, with no Bible, but he says, turn to Luke, and then he starts reading all the way through. And he goes, are you there? Are you there? And he, said, and he starts quoting the whole thing down like, I have no idea. He's waiting for everybody to get there. He's like, are you there? Are you there? And he's like, and he just, I'm like, this is disgusting. It's disgusting, man. But it would be frustrating to be blind now. And you know what? When you get blind, what would you be when you start? You couldn't see anymore. You'd be angry. If God was to take away a major sense of yours, particularly hearing, and well, hearing might not be bad at this point in time or Sunday mornings, but I mean, did you just raise your eyebrows at me? But, uh, but being blind, you, you know what? You would get... You, I, you would be, you'd be bitter. You'd be bitter for a while. A lot of people wouldn't sit there and say, oh, thank you, God, for making me blind. That's why you read stories about Helen Keller and other people that uh, did something in their life. You're like, how do they do that, man? How do you, how's Marge and Kathy in a wheelchair get along with that? I, I, you, oh, I wouldn't be bitter, brother. You're bitter now when your heat doesn't come on in your car. <laughs> you get upset now. God, I can't believe this is not working right now. And you have, you have like every convenience known to man, but the one thing that doesn't work, I hate you, God, I'm not serving you anymore. So imagine losing your sight in particular when we're talking about this mystery. Just imagine how angry and how provoked you'd be. And look how this turns to them going directly against the preachers and the gospel itself. Brother Kenny, go ahead. 15 to 25 of Acts 9. Please. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings, and for the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, O Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mayest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Okay, did you just pick that up right there? What happened to a Jewish man? What fell off his eyes? So what would he be spiritually? One of them got it. And the mystery hasn't even been revealed to him yet. Interesting. What, what animal do you think of in particular that has scales? Then don't say fish or I'll smash you. <laughs> Thank you. Be saved. Say serpent. Preacher, we agree with it. I, I think of, now you might think of a fish, but that's because whatever. You're not cool. But I, I, I think of a serpent. And you know the serpent blinds the minds of them which believe not. See how I tied that in? So take your fish and hit the road. Anyway, all right. <laughs> Verse 19. Go ahead, Kenny. And when he had received me, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Mo, did you just help him out? <laughs> Honestly, hold on for a minute. Paul, Paul. Yeah, I'm not addressing anybody. I got to talk to these two over here. Get that woman under control. Go. <laughs> yeah, man. No, she's on the rails. That's the problem, man. 
Go, Damascus, Brother Kenny, I'll help you. <laughs> Verse 20, go ahead. <laughs> That's pretty cool. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is this not he that destroyed them which called mm -hmm. his name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bond unto the chief priests? But Saul increased mm -hmm. in strength and confounded the Jews right. which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Mm hmm. Look at this. You're going to kill one of your own? You, you're going to go against him. He's the guy that you held as your champion that would go out and kill Christians. Throwing men and women in jail, hauling some of them off to be, to be murdered and slaughtered for their faith in Christ. And now he's converted. And now he's preaching that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in your synagogues and all that. And look what the Bible says. The Jews are off the bat. One of the things about his ministry you read earlier was he sent to the Gentiles. We know that. He's also appeared before kings. We know that. But who else did God say he's going to preach to? Israel, man. Absolutely. So though he is the apostle of the Gentiles, part of his ministry in general, just like Peter's is to the circumcision primarily, but he's the one that opens the door of faith to the Gentiles, part of Paul's ministry is he's supposed to go to the Israelites as well, and they want to kill him. Why? Because he's preaching what now? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, wasn't there somebody at the crucifixion that day that said, truly, this man was the Son of God? Old Gentile centurion. Look with me. Go on chapter 13, please. Uh, Mo, I'm going to have you do 13, 6 through 11, please. And maybe a couple more if you're, if you're cool and don't start whispering. <laughs> Actually, if you could do, thir if you could do 14, uh, 13, 4 through 11. <laughs> you know what bar Jesus means? All kidding aside? <laughs> he, he's, yeah, he's claiming to be the son of Jesus. Thankfully, you don't have any movies or books like that nowadays, do you? I don't know what it, but the guy's name, I guess, was Dan Brown. Is that correct? Not a family member. Not getting any money from that dude. Uh, but he, he did uh, Da Vinci Code, right? Wasn't the basis of that that he had that Jesus Christ had family, or that he and Mary Magdalene had children? Or I don't know the premise. There's some sort of bloodline that went through Europe, and that the okay the fa so this well this again again uh, pre wrath and all that stuff. God knew about that two thousand years ago. You didn't need uh, you didn't need Rosenthal or any of these other clowns. You had two guys that withstood Timothy and Paul. Uh, you don't need people to come up and say, well, I have a book and movies to make about Jesus having offspring. He didn't. You know what kind of offspring he has now? Spiritual ones. But there's a guy back here saying, oh, bar Jesus, I'm the son of Jesus. Like bar Jonah is the son of Jonah. Interesting. Keep on going, please. Which was the deputy of the country, uh, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question. What, 
What was Bar Jesus? What was his nationality? What was his religion? He's a Jew. What's he trying to prevent something from happening right here? What's he trying to prevent from happening? Someone trusting the Lord. Now he's a preventer. In fact, the Apostle Paul calls him a child of who? Full of all. And what else? It's interesting, Jennifer said mischief. So what's the other one? <laughs> Subtlety. Or subtility of some other people's... Subtlety, man. Now, isn't that interesting that the devil... He's more subtle than any beast of the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what did Jesus Christ say in John 8, 44? Ye of your... That's a child of the devil right there. Full of all mischief and subtlety. John 8, 44, Genesis 3, and that one right there. That's what children of the devil, full of mischief and, and uh, subtlety, man. But he, what's he doing? He's preventing the gospel from going... He's an enemy of the preacher. How would you like to do that on Sunday morning? Oh, you don't like what I'm preaching? You fool of the devil, children of the devil. Why don't you guys go out of here blind? <laughs> I don't want to be back. I'm happy right where I'm at in this day and age, man. Had those apostles walking around throwing stuff on you, man. <laughs> wow. While you're right here, uh, Polly, I need you to get the same, same thing, 44 to 52, please. 44 to 52. And the next half they came almost the whole city together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming them. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, Yes. It was necessary that the word of God first have been spoken to you, for seeing ye put it from mm -hmm. and judge yourselves unworthily of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have sent thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordered to eternal life, ordained, ordained yep. to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and, and honorable women, and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them out of their coast. <laughs> the Jews would stand them at the beginning, then the Jews would stand them again. You don't realize how big this is, that the blindness in part has caused them now, they're provoked, and now it's just like I mentioned earlier, the illustration, you lose your sight, you get angry, you get bitter, and now look what happens. God is turning the page to the Gentiles, and now it's not just like, okay, we missed out on it, we can still get in on it, but we don't want anybody else to get it. In fact, we're going to do everything we can to withstand these Gentiles from getting it. In fact, we're going to contradict what the preacher says. We're going to blaspheme against the, our God, and we're going to blaspheme what the preacher says. And you know what? When he goes to the next town, we're going to have some Jews there that raise up. And they're enemies, man, right now of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I understand that doesn't really happen much in our, in our, our, our particular area of Connecticut. We don't have a lot of Jews coming out with the, you know, the hats and the, <laughs> the curly cues and freaking out on us, man. You know, in front of you, you know, freaking out. But you got to think about this. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of our salvation. But what's the, what's the foundation you and I are built on? The, the apostles and prophets, according to Ephesians chapter number 2. What these men went through serves as the basis for where you and I are today. You didn't get this King James Bible by magic. People died getting you this book against great opposition, primarily from the one to whom the book was given to. The Jews hate the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to talk to somebody about, uh, about the Lord that, is a, that actually is a real Jew. Very difficult to deal with. Uh, if you notice most of Hollywood now, not, not now, back in the day, a lot of those people were converted, converted Jews or were Jews straight up. Have you ever seen that? Do you know Sammy Davis Jr.? Sammy Davis Jr., black man, the entertainer. You guys don't know who that is. Good, you're probably better off. You know what Jude, Sammy Davis Jr. converted to? Judaism. Why? Because you think you're going to get in on the merits of Judaism? 
A lot of those singers, a lot of those entertainers, uh, you see uh, the guys that used to write All in the Family and all those comedies in the 70s, you kill her, she can't have that. Their last names were like Weintraub and Turtletaub. I'm dead serious. Uh, Norman Lear. Those guys are all Jews, man. Well, why, why don't you get to the oracles of God that were given to you? Because blindness and pirates have to. In fact, it's not just the blindness. They're enemies of this thing now. That's why it is possible for Jews to get saved by the grace of God and through the blood of Christ. But boy, what did we read last week? The veil. That veil can only be taken away in Christ. You've got to get them, and God's got to get them through that book to see who Jesus Christ is. Because that blindness... And now the provocation that's in them that, you know what, whenever we hear the gospel preached in this time and this day and age, 2,000 years ago, we're going we're gonna to do whatever we can to withstand the preachers of this Jesus. You mean Jesus of the tribe of Judah? You mean the lion of the tribe of Judah? Yeah, but he didn't do it the way we wanted him to do it. We want Barabbas. Okay, gotcha. This is a big mystery, man. I know one day, and we'll look at it next week because we're not going to get there now, I know... They're going to get it physically. But if you die as a Jew today without Christ, you're not getting a physical inheritance, and you're not getting resurrected to get a second chance. There's a clown in Texas that teaches that. He's a big, famous preacher. And when I say big, I mean like four, nine, big, this way. He doesn't teach or preach on temperance, obviously. His name's John Hagee, in case you're wondering. The Jews that are lost will get a second chance. You got some Bible for that. Well, they're God's chosen people. Uh, again, there's a rich man in hell right now who's a Jew, and he's not getting out. If they're not going to get sick. You die now, the only chance you're going to get is come up out of hell when the great, at the great white throne judgment and have your account before the God of the universe before you go to the lake of fire. That's not funny, man. But they're that blindness and now the anger and the provocation and the resistance they have to God's preachers and God's word and God's gospel, it's unbelievable. Go with me to chapter 14 while we're right here. Uh, who we up to? We're at to Brother Burt. Brother Burt, can you get 14, 1 through 7, please? And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. Mm -hmm. But the unbelieving Jews yeah. stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds <laughs> evil effects against the brethren. One time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly of the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers, to use them mm -hmm. as the stone men, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of like Caonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. <laughs> did you see what the unbelieving Jews did? They're so wicked and evil and bent against the gospel, they're getting unbelieving Gentiles who in just the previous chapter said, we can't wait to hear this. And then they shake out the dust and they go to Iconium, and guess what? You see some Gentiles getting saved in verses 1 and 2, and you see some Jews getting saved in verses 1 and 2, but that unbelieving contingent of Jews said, we're not having any more of this stuff. Nope, let's have a little uprise. Let's have a little insurrection. Let's get a, let's get a little rebellion going on here. We're going to stop those preachers, man. Folks, you say, well, what's the big deal with that? I'm, I'm thankful for the way we have it today where we get to go out in the street. And honestly, the police, for some bizarre reason, are on our side. And it's not just because we obey the law, even though we should have a testimony and do that. It's just for some bizarre reason, they are actually waiting for us to be out there. It's strange. I will take that. But if it doesn't happen that way and somehow somebody gets in the air and says, hey, we don't like those preachers and you meet a cop or two and they're lost and... Who knows? Maybe they start kicking us off there. Then what are we going to do? But they get evil affected by somebody getting in there and saying, well, you know what they're preaching. And I heard them say something about sodomites and queers and gays, and that's hate speech and all that stuff. Folks, that's happening now up in Canada and other places. Where if you use the term sodomite or queer, that's a jailable offense, man. It's been going on for several years now. I don't need, believe you need to be name calm, but the word sodomite is in the King James Bible. 
Okay? That, it's in there. In fact, if you have an NIV, it's not in there. Go look that one up. You know who the lady was that headed up the revisory board and the addition of board? Uh, addition, yeah, addition of board. Addition board for the NIV? She's a lesbian. Her name was Virginia Mollencott. She was a lesbian. That's in the late 60s, early 70s. Why do you think sodomite's not in the in an NIV? Because the people writing it, that's what they want to promote. Go check it out. Don't take one. One, one more time. Did they change the wording of it? Or it's, it's the word sodomite is gone. I don't remember. I think it's, uh, what is it, Vestal Virgin or Temple? No, Temple... Uh, Temple prostitutes or temple, it's something like that. You can find in the book of Kings because the Sodomites built their house right next to the house of the Lord. But I think it's, uh, I think it's temple prostitute, I think, is the term that they use it. But the, the word Sodomite is, just go look it up, man. I mean, you have an NIV at home. I'll go check it out when you get a chance, man. Get, get your little, go get your week's concordance and look it up, man. Because it wouldn't be strong. It's not a King James mouth. I'm just saying, man, it's, it's, it's bizarre, you know, uh, but I, I, nonetheless, I, but I'm, what I'm saying, my point being is that take advantage of what you have now because our brothers and sisters in Christ aren't enjoying this. And whether it's, you know, Chinese people who are godless and don't love Jesus Christ and all that stuff, persecuting our brethren over there, well, okay, but I mean, the, it starts from the Jews hate the God that came to save them, and it's all part of that blindness that's going on in their anger now and their provocation that these pigs and dogs, these Gentiles, these Samaritans, half-breeds are getting in on it when that was for them. Well, you had it, but you wanted a thief and a murderer. God does hold you accountable for your decisions. Thank God he doesn't pull the lever every single bad decision I make. But at some point in time, the Lord says, enough, enough. It's wild stuff, man. So you're, read, you're reading just part of it here with the, the Jews. Keep on, uh, uh, Deb, can you get same chapter, please? I need you to get uh, 19 through 22. Same chapter, 14, 19 through 22, please. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Deb. Did you, you just read that right there in 19. And there came there there certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul. Do you, does anybody know what background Paul is genealogically? What tribe is he from? He's a full-blood Jew. You're going to kill one of your own? What's the tipping point on the scale for that? Stop preaching Jesus Christ. Stop preaching that gospel. Stop preaching it to those Gentiles. That's what you're seeing here in the whole shift of part of the provocation of the, the, the nation of Israel is that they're so angry right now because God has turned the page. Can they still get saved? Sure they can. You just read it in the previous portion of chapter 14. There were Jews getting converted. But there's that unbelieving sect who says, you know what, that's not going to happen here. In fact, you know what, let's kill the head preacher. Let's stone him. That's pretty wild stuff, man. Uh, of ways to die, that's probably not in my top three or four. I mean, because the first rock take, takes you in the, like the knee, and you go, oh. And on and on and on the on the way down, on the way down, you take one in the head, and you go, oh. And then another one cracks you in the left eye, and you're like, oh. And then they just start keep throwing them on you. Pretty soon, there's a heap of rocks around you. That's got to be a horrible way to die. Like, especially if, like, you get your toe, little toe broken, and then your instep broken, and then your, that's on one foot, and then your ankle broken, and then you got a, uh, you know, a sharpshooter with his arm, he can pick out any part of your body. I can't throw strikes, but I'll hit your kidneys from 100 feet away, buddy. I'll hit any helmet on any kid anywhere, anytime. But I, I can't throw it across the plate, but I can hit any body part you want, man. But imagine, yeah, imagine that. And typically when you stone somebody, they were in the lower portion, and you had the higher ground. 
pick a nice rock out. Oh, that, that one, yeah, that feels like a Rawlings. That's a good one right there. You, you kill, that's, what they're, that's what Jews are doing to a preacher of the gospel. All part of that blindness. Just stack, what's the problem, man? Why don't you come to the true light? What's the problem, man? Because God put it on them for all the stuff. I mean, you see the whole compilation of what Israel has done and how God has divorced them, Jeremiah 3, and how he put them away like a harlot and, and, a, and a fornicating woman. He's put them away, and then he sends his son, and I understand it's ordained of God. I understand all that stuff and the foreknowledge of God and all that term, counsel foreknowledge of God. But to hear those people in voice scream out, we have no king but Caesar. Man. Okay. Gotcha. Well, here's one of the mysteries. You're going to be blind in part. Yeah, but we have all the oracles, and all the prophets are ours, and all the signs and wonders are ours, and the Ten Commandments are ours. And Yeah, you're going to be blind in part now. <laughs> I'm going to make it even more difficult for you. And the gospel is the easiest today that it'll ever be for somebody to get saved. And the Jews still can't see it. And you see this whole thing, this whole mystery unfold. Even though they're God's chosen people physically. Go with me over to... Uh, Chapter 17. Jennifer, chapter 17, please. I need you to do 1 through 9, please. Now when they had passed through in the field, mm -hmm. <laughs> So when it says right there, they go to the synagogue of the Jews, then it says verse 4, and some of them believed and could soar with Paul and Silas and of, the de and, the, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. Who's the some of them that believed in verse 4? They'd be the Jews. And then the Greeks get in on it. Now look what happens in verse number 5. Let me ask you a question. What was the motivating emotion of the nation of Israel when they crucified their Savior? Matthew 27, 18. What was the motivating factor of Joseph's brethren? Envy. It's still here. Keep on going. So the unbelieving Jews, look what they're doing here. The, the, the Jews who believe not. So this, this is going to have an uproar. Assault, an, uh, they commit assault. These, these, this is wild. Go ahead, Jennifer. <laughs> They're still clinging to Caesar is their king? They're still going at it? Several years after the crucifixion of their Messiah and resurrection? They're still claiming Caesar's their king? Do you know why they wanted that to be? You know why they, the uh, high priest con conspired? Because they didn't want the Romans to remove them out of their nation. And now it's turned up on high heat, man. Any preacher, any convert, any believer of the gospel, any setter forth that Jesus is the Christ, any talk of the death, burial, and resurrection of this Savior, we're going to beat the tar out of them. I mean, they're assaulting them. They go to the guy's house, they pull them out, and they're like, these guys have turned the world upside down. Isn't that the way it seems? It's two or three saved people, and you think there's like 10 million of them. Well, that's because there's more with us than there's more with them. You just can't see them all with us. But they're thinking, these Christians are everywhere. These saved people are everywhere. All they do is preach all the time. That's all they do, that's all they do is talk about this resurrected Christ. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And they're going to withstand it. Jonathan, um, I need you to get 10 through 17. Same chapter, please. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who 
coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things, those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge of the word of God, Get in disputes, get in the fights. Who was it? These are his own people by tribe, by nation. What's the one thing that keeps setting him apart and getting them angry? Jesus Christ. It's good for you to have some enemies for Jesus Christ. Paul has not done anything wrong. He hasn't broken their customs. He hasn't broken their traditions. He's done nothing illegal. He's just preached one thing, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, and they hate him for it. And they're going to do everything they can to stop him from preaching. It's all part of that blindness that's happened to him. While you're right here, chapter 18. James, I need you to get chapter 18, please. And if you could, 7 through 13. Uh, Gal yeah, Galio. Yep. Was deputy of Achaia. The Jews made insurrection with one with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, "This fellow persuaded men to worship God contrary to the law." Did he? Did he? Did he? Did he? Was he? Com was Paul committing? any problem. Who's committing the insurrection? Who's throwing stones? Who's the one withstanding God and the preaching of God's word? The Jews are. What's the matter, man? He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, isn't he? What's, what's the problem? Yeah, we want him on our terms. We don't want this Jesus fella. And we certainly don't want any of his followers mentioning his name. Go with me over to chapter number 20. I know, I know it's boring, man. I get it. It's, it's Bible study, man. I, I get it. It's Wednesday night. You want to go crib? I know. But it's nice weather out right now. I know. It's, it's beautiful out, man. It's got, maybe Al Gore was right. Maybe the Earth didn't, Maybe it is. Global warming. Yeah. The only thing getting warm on Al is his, his rear side, man, because he's like 300 pounds now, man. I saw a picture of that guy, man. Seriously, what happened, man? That's global warming right there. That's climate change. Yeah, seriously, man. Chapter number 20. All right, Paul, that's enough. Cha <laughs> Taylor, we'll talk later, Paul. I'll text you later, but don't worry. Don't worry about what I say in public. It's okay, man. Uh, 20, 1 through 3, Taylor, please. And after the uproar was seized, Paul <laughs> uproar. and his disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much, much exhortation, he came into Greece, and there abode three months. And when the Jews lay wait for him, <laughs> <laughs> he laid. They're laying in wait. You ever seen those old cartoons, man, where the coyote, uh, where the, uh, the the wolf dresses up like Granny and he's laying in wait for Bugs Bunny who puts on the Red Riding Hood thing? If not, go get the DVD. It's phenomenal. <laughs> well, I mean, what are you doing? You're laying in wait to trap somebody. You're, you're laying in wait to kill them. Why? 
Has he, has he preached against circumcision? Has he preached against anything? He hasn't even gone against Diana. He says, I, I haven't blasphemed your goddess. I mean, honestly, all he's doing is preaching Jesus Christ. And they hate him for it. They hate that gospel. They're enemies of it. Chapter 21, please. Haley, 21. Chapter 21, we've got a couple more. I know we're grinding, man. I know we're grinding. We're grinding. 25, 26, 20, uh, 25 through 28, Haley. Please. It's always not now. I don't. I don't. Not a big conspiracy theorist or anything. But if you ever know anything about the Bilderbergers and all that stuff, you know how people think that all the Jews have the money and Jews control all the gold and Jews control all the banks and all that stuff. I'm just saying that there's a reason why the spiritually the blindness of part has happened to them, and there's a reason why this all. They are direct enemies against the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and, and provoking people to join in with them. They're attacking a preacher because all he's saying is Jesus Christ is alive. Chapter number 23, Justin, 23, 6 through 10. Please, 23, 6 through 10. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, He's cried, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead I am called in question. And when he had said so, when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was, was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, mm -hmm. We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dis dis dissension, mm -hmm. the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. They're trying to. Paul and the Lord stood by him. No, you're good. You're good. Verse number 10. That's good. They're, they're going to pull them in pieces. Chapter 25. Kenny, chapter 25. 1, 2, and 3 of chapter 25, Brother Kenny. Please. Now, when Festus was. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, if you. Gun smoke, man. Okay, never mind. Go ahead. Never mind. No, he's not from Rhode Island. Province. Yes. I thought, I thought Festus went to Rhode Island, man. Go ahead. Go ahead, man. After three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him informed him against Paul and besought him, and desired favor against him, that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. <laughs> He's their brother according to the flesh, but not according to the Spirit of God, because they're unregenerate, and they hate their Savior, who he's now preaching about but he's their flesh and blood from Benjamin. So they are God's people physically. God turns the page because of the rejection of the Savior throughout the book of Acts. It goes further than that. Now they're actually enemies of the gospel of God. I know they can still be saved. I know they can still be washed in the blood. But look at the fight. How many verses did we just go over? 
they're always against the, every time. The Gentiles aren't giving, the, giving this much trouble to the Apostle Paul. So is Jews, man. Last one, and we are done. Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter 11, where we started a little, little bit ago. We'll read the mystery, and then we'll, we'll close. Romans 11, please. Verse 25 says this, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. We'll look at that next week, Lord willing. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. That's, that's the second coming. Look at verse 28. As, now, he just told you about the mystery. He just told you what he's going to do for them. But look at what's going on now. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, that's the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, covenant promises, all that. They are beloved for the Father's sakes, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God has not forgotten those Jews, nor will he forget them. He picked them. He chose them. They're his physical people, physical nation. His Savior, his son came from that, from the tribe of Judah. But you know what? Right now, they are so contrary to the gospel, they're actually enemies of it. But we're still supposed to witness to him. We're still supposed to preach the gospel to him. We're still supposed to pray for him. Father, thank you again for the night. Thank you for the opportunity to meet around the book. Thank you for all the, the verses on this topic, Father. I know it is uh, not being smart, Father. You already know it. It's, it is dry to go through all the verses, but I, I hope it would be a blessing and a help to some folks that want to dig into it. Maybe make a little uh, concordance or study on, on their own, Father, just to... Nail these things down in their heart. I know this, <laughs> this is not going to change anybody's prayer life per se, Father, and it's a lot of factual information, but I, I do pray that just the blessing of being able to turn to a book that's purified and perfect and holy would encourage them to get into it more, Father, and to trust it more and to hide some of these exceeding great and precious promises in their heart for when the times come in their life that they, they really, Father, need to lean on you. And, um, Father, that's, that's really every man of every day anyway. So thank you again for the night. Thank you for our great Savior. Thank you for our great King. Father, we do await with great joy to see our blessed hope come in the clouds for us. We thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.